Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast in which we explore all things Beatles, uh, anything to do with the group, the soloists, their past, present, future, if we can figure it out. I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you may also know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hey, Ken, how are you doing? Good, Alan. Hi, guys. And Steve Marinucci, who writes the Beatles Examiner columns and several other Examiner columns on the web. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? Hi, uh, Alan Cozen, uh, who you didn't introduce. Uh, oh, right. I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> oh, everybody knows me. <laughs> <laughs> and Al Sussman, uh, the executive editor of Beatle Fan and an author in his own right. How are you doing, Al? Hey, Alan. Hello there, everybody. Okay, and I apparently am Alan Cozen. And uh, <laughs> we also have... Or Alan Cozen Remixed. Remixed, yes, that's right. There we go. I should change my name officially to Alan Cozen Remixed. We also have today with us a very special guest, the very prolific Bruce Spizer, who's here to talk about his really whole library of books, um, some of which are now being sort of reincarnated in digital form as PDFs um, with new information and new pictures, things like that. And uh, Bruce, I think you're going to be at Beetlefest coming up, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. I'm going to, I think Al may know my schedule better than I do, but is I will be doing a panel sometime on Friday evening with right. Al about the year 1966. I'll be giving a presentation on Saturday on the Butcher cover, which will be an audio-visual presentation. And then I think I'll be talking about the Capitol albums on Sunday. So, you know, at least that and maybe some more things. Okay. And you were just in uh, in the Grammy Museum's show too weren't you yes they had a symposium co-sponsored with delta state university mm -hmm. and the new grammy museum in cleveland mississippi and mm -hmm. uh it was a really uh fabulous facility it's about a two-hour drive from memphis about a five-hour drive from new orleans and there are all sorts of historical mississippi blues sites along the way so um it currently has the traveling wilburys or actually the traveling beetles exhibit uh, and it'll be there for the next couple of months before it moves on to another location. If you haven't seen the Beatles exhibit, it's a wonderful opportunity to see it and also take in a really great new museum. And close to the uh, museum in Cleveland, Mississippi, is the B.B. King Museum, about 30 minutes away. So if you're into blues music and the Beatles, uh, it's a perfect combination. Mm hmm. Now, we spoke to Jude Kessler a few weeks ago before this event happened, and she was telling us about some of the things they were going to have. Now that it's happened, how did it go from your perspective? I think it really went well. Uh, you know, the speakers all, I think, did a good job. They have a little auditorium there uh, that was used for the speakers. And I gave two tours of the exhibit itself, well, you know, where I could point out certain pieces that I had more knowledge of than the actual, uh, you know, you couldn't really in the museum do a big write-up about all, certain items. So I think it was a lot of fun. I think the people who went to it had a lot of fun, and it was topped off with a Beatles tribute band playing a concert after the uh, speakers. So I think everyone who went had a really good time. And uh, as I've said, I was very impressed with the museum itself. Was it well attended, and, and how would you describe the audience? Was it uh, old people like us, or a lot of young people, or a <laughs> good mix? <laughs> I think mainly older people, although there were a lot of students there, and some people that brought their kids along. So, you know, it's like any Beatles convention where you have uh, multi-generational would be the best way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Bruce, how would you compare the, the Grammy Museum to, say, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Uh, I think this museum, when it gets more exhibits and things in place, uh, will be right up there with it. The, the layout's really simple. It's on one floor, so you're not going up and down steps or elevators. And I think that aspect mm. of it's uh, really nice. It has a you know just a nice physical appearance. It's very clean, you know. And yes. the people, <laughs> people there are very friendly. Uh, 
being from the South, you know, I can say without a doubt that Southern people are of a very friendly nature and uh, very helpful. So, you know, I think that it would be a great trip for somebody who you could start, in the words of Martha Hoopa, all the way from Memphis and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, do your, your Elvis and Son record thing in Memphis and then work your way down to Cleveland and work your way down to New Orleans. It'd be quite a trip. Mm hmm. I was going to ask Bruce how it compares to the L.A. Grammy Museum, but you said it's only on one floor. Yeah, but only on one floor, but it's a big floor. So mm. I don't think it's as many exhibits at this time, but I think as far as going to see it, uh, you know, it, it's really very convenient. Uh, there, They have a lot of interactive things. And one of the things I have that I'm not sure if it's in L.A., but it might be because I've been to L.A. a few times, but, you know, don't remember everything in it is, a room where you can go in it and hear how certain albums would have sounded had they been on a cylinder, on a 78 RPM disc, on an album, on a cassette, and then a 5.1 surround mix. So I thought that was kind of interesting to hear the evolution of the uh, musical formats. I don't remember seeing that when I was in L.A., but they, I mean, they may rotate things around. But Well, this I've is kind of a new thing that uh, you know, will be permitted at that museum. Mm, boy, that that does sound nice. Mm -hmm. That's got to be exciting for anyone who's young who doesn't know the whole history of how recorded music began and to hear what mm. music sounded like then on disc yeah. and then further on up. So It really is. I mean, to give you an idea of the perspective, I was giving a talk at a Beatles convention one time, and I was talking about the Beatles 45s, and some young kid said, the Beatles had guns? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Oh boy! All right! Wow! Wow! <laughs> so, Bruce, you've been um, you've been focusing lately a bit on the butcher cover, and it's going to be one of your talks, as you said. Um, can you give us some sort of idea of what you've been finding about it? Well, the, the thing was that for many, many years, people felt that the story was that the Beatles were tired of Capitol chopping up their albums, in effect, butchering their albums. So they got this great idea to pose for a picture with raw meat uh, to send the message of Capital Butchers, the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And um, Brian Epstein, their manager, was into pop art and sick humor, so Brian was in favor of the cover. And uh, Mojo Magazine and others have gone to say that Paul was the Beatle who was behind it. And, of course, um, that when the cover had to be pulled from the market, the Beatles were hastily gathered together again to get their picture taken around a steamer trunk, and if you look at their expressions, you can see they're upset with the butcher cover having been recalled. Mm. And that's a story yeah, that's been out there for years. That's right. Mm. Of course, none of that's true, right. you know, very little of it. So <laughs> the true story, as many people know, the starting point is that Bob Whitaker was hired by Brian to take pictures of the Beatles, and his first session produced the cover to Beatles uh, 65, and it was the four seasons. If you look at the cover, you see winter, spring, summer, or fall, or as Carol King would say, all you have to do is call. Mm. And so <laughs> Bob Whitaker, a year later, got a little bit more creative in that he had them with tin foil, in cellophane, in styrofoam, you know, and also a pose where there was a Salvador Dali type eye behind them. And so when he had his next photo session, it was a bit of a mystery as to what it would be. And at that particular photo session, the good news for us is that the Beatles book had one of their photographers, Nigel Dixon, at that photo session. Mm -hmm. And so he took a lot of candid shots of the Beatles, and he took pictures of the Beatles getting their portrait taken by Whitaker, because Whitaker needed to get the portrait taken. And by seeing Dixon's pictures, we learned that Whitaker had an assistant with a camera, which explains why for the butcher session, you have both color and black and white film. Mm -hmm. And that's because there were two photographers, one shooting color, one shooting black and white. Mm -hmm. So we know that. And mm -hmm. then Dixon also took some pictures of Whitaker lining up some of the shots, like the birdcage shot, or the nails shot into John's head. Right. So we have a lot of visual information that we did not have before. And I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we also now know that um, the trunk session was taken on a particular date. And Mark Lewison and I were able to kind of put that together. And one of the key pieces that was missing was that the Bavarian Beatles store, and I think Frank's the guy's name, he had some images on his website. And were fascinating because one of them was Bob Whitaker setting up a trunk photo. And I asked him what else he had, and he sent me more images. And I said, you know, what's the source of this? And he said, well, these were taken with Thomas Beale's camera. And so, of course, I had to show my ignorance of all things German and ask who Thomas Beale was. <laughs> and he was one of the chief writers for Bravo magazine. And it all fell into place because the Beatles were going to be playing in Germany shortly thereafter. So it would make sense for Thomas Beale to interview the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So when I gave that information to Mark Lewis and we were able to determine that there were two dates around that time when the Beatles had interviews at NEMS, at Brian's office. And of course, we know from the trunk cover photo, it was taken at Brian's office. I was able to rule out one of them because it was from a different magazine being present that day. So that meant it had to be on this particular date. So we determined the day that the butcher photos were taken. So that was kind of a good bit of information. The trunk photos. There also were several memos that uh, hit the market, capital memos in letters. And Gary Hine of um, his uh, you know, group, mm. Fab Four, uh, was it Fab Collectibles or whatever Gary calls himself. <laughs> anyway, Gary was a big help because he provided that information to me. And with that, I was able to really kind of put together the story, and I'll be telling it at the fest. But the interesting thing is that you have the photo session of the butcher cover and all these other crazy images first. Then you have a photo session at NEMS. And Tony Barrow had told me that this photo session was sort of impromptu, that the Beatles were going to be there anyway. And the idea was, well, look, as long as we have the boys together, why don't we get Whitaker to take some pictures? And I think part of that may have been that Brian was rightly concerned about the last photo session. Mm -hmm. He just wanted some more shots of the boys. Mm -hmm. So the other interesting thing from these photos that I was able to license from the Beatles Bavarian store is that you see Ringo and George looking at some pictures. And when you blow it up, the pictures they're looking at are black and white shots from the butcher session. Okay. So ah. you see the Beatles <clears throat> seeing them there, but what's really cool is there's this shot of Whitaker with this excited look on his face and John with this gleeful look on his face <laughs> so that the Beatles are seeing the butcher shots for the first time and John is really excited about it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's a shot of Thomas Beale and Paul sitting down at a desk looking at them and both of them look sullen and perplexed would be about <laughs> the best way to describe it. <laughs> so mm. we have that wonderful information and we know that at about this time, Capitol was putting together its new Beatles album. And as was the case with the prior few albums, Capitol requested a photo from Brian. You know, this, I'm deducing, I don't have a memo proving that, but that had to be the case. And Brian sends them the trunk photo. So Capitol dutifully uses the picture sent to them by Brian. You said the trunk photo? The trunk photo, yeah. Huh, okay. Trunk is first, folks. Really? Trunk, huh. Yes. Huh. <laughs> okay. I told you huh. I was turning this story on its head. Yeah. So what happens is they get the trunk photo, and they make a design with it. And it has a blue rectangle on the side. Mm -hmm. It has the Beatles in white and the song titles in yellow. And the album's called Yesterday and Today. Now, if you take a look, and of course it's hard to do this in a podcast, but for those of you out there that have your Beatles collection handy, take a look at an image of either in one of my books or your collection of the Yesterday single on Capitol. At the top, it has a blue rectangle with the Beatles in white and the songs in yellow. So effectively, what Capitol did was they wanted to be prying, you know, playing on the effect that this album is called Yesterday and Today, and it's a pun. 
Yesterday is originally in quotes there because it's mm. a song title. They even use the same color scheme as the yesterday picture sleeve. Mm. And so that's done. And everything is ready to go for this album. And they need to get the cover going. There is a memo sending this blue trunk cover to Queen's Litho for production. And in it, however, there's a handwritten P.S. And it says P.S. to Barry. I was able to determine that Barry is Barry Cohn of Queen's Litho. And basically what the memo says is do not begin printing until you hear from me next Monday. There is a problem with the Beatles manager. He mm -hmm. has a problem with Brian. What we can deduce from this memo is that Brian did something he hadn't done before. He wanted to see the album cover and approve it. And that was causing a delay. So Capital sends him the album cover and he looks at it and he doesn't like it. Which is kind of strange because Brian was the one that sent him the photo to begin with. And this is the trunk cover. Yes. And apparently Brian maybe didn't like the garish colors on the, you know, on the thing. So we, we just don't know why he didn't like it, but he didn't like it. And so Capital needs to come up with a new design. And they have their art department come up with alternate trunk designs, which I'll call alternates one, two, and three. And in the meantime, one of, well, one of them has sort of a blue background. It tilts the photo. Alternate design two has the white background and only has I've cut out the trunk in the Beatles and it has a group's name and song titles not in that psychedelic font that you see on the trunk cover but in block letters and mm. another alternate design has two images of the Beatles in the trunk which is really bizarre but they send Brian a mock-up of alternate design too not the actual design but a mock-up just saying hey Brian look if you don't like all those colors, we can use a white background and we can put in song titles. And you can see that on page 281 of your book, Brian, yes. looking at that cover, <laughs> as it looks like a Chiswick house. That's With, the significance. Yeah. The day before Brian looks at that cover, Paul and the Beatles are doing the video at Abbey Road Studios for Paperback Rider in Rain. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the video, Paul is holding up something. If you look closely, you can see it in the book by expanding it. That's the great thing about digital. If you expand it, you see Paul is looking at color transparencies of the butcher cover. And so that creates an interesting situation where Paul is looking at the color transparencies. So the next day, they're at Chiswick's Garden, as we well know. And Ryan is looking at this boring trunk cover. John and Paul, the day before, have seen the color transparencies. And so it should come as no great shock to us when John looks at that boring butcher cover, I mean boring trunk cover, and says to Brian, oh, no, no, don't use that for the cover. Use the butcher photo for the cover. And that's how it comes about. It's certainly not Paul. It's John. If you look at the anthology book and the quotes about the butcher cover, John's the one who says, I really push for that cover. Mm. And believe me, it had to have been John. So yeah. here's what happens. Brian, we don't have the dialogue, but we know Brian had to have been horrified by this. And so he's trying to argue with John and Paul. But remember, by 66, Brian wasn't running the show. John and Paul were running the show. Yeah. So Brian's job was then to talk to Capitol and insist on this. So he sends it to Capitol. I interviewed George Osakwe, who was head of the art department at Capitol, and I interviewed Alan Livingston, who was president of Capitol. So I know what happened at that end. What happens at that end is Osakwe loves the picture. He gets all excited about it. He uses a psychedelic font for the album title Yesterday and Today. And he goes ahead and gets this done. The sales department sees it and they freak out. And they go to Alan and they say, this can't be the cover. And Alan agrees it can't be. And he gets on the phone with Brian, and Brian insists that it be the cover. And so his idea is to do a limited run with the butcher cover. But the production department knows that isn't feasible. So what they do, and once again, there is a letter that you know I have in the book, and the letter is sent to Barry Cohn of Queens Litho, and it includes alternate design one, alternate design two, alternate design three, and also the butcher cover. 
and two Beach Boy things, which were not relevant to discussion. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there is also a letter that is sent to a guy with Capitol Records who was based in New York. And Barry Cohn is supposed to get those images to this guy in Capitol in New York. Now, why does Capitol's New York guy need it? Because, once again, confirming the timing with Mark Lewison, as I suspected, Mark tells me I'm spot on. Brian was in New York at that time to promote the Beatles' upcoming 1966 tour. So, Brian's in New York, and this Capitol employee, Tom Morgan's job is to meet with Brian and ideally get him to pick one of those alternate designs. But if he insists on the butcher cover, so be it. And so Brian insists on the butcher cover. So Capital goes ahead at Brian's insistence, even though Brian hates the cover and is worried what it'll do to the group's image. Capital goes ahead, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And rather than doing a few hundred like Livingston suggests, does a complete run of the butcher cover. You know, and their sales forecast on this album were 1.2 million. So they do all these butcher covers. And then, as you know, Capital tries to set, well, descends it to radio stations and distributors, and everybody screams about it, and the butcher cover comes to a halt. And now, Alan Livingston must give Brian the bad news. Brian's petrified because he's worried John and Paul will be upset with him, uh, but relieved that it's not going to happen. <laughs> And Alan asks him, what was this about? And Brian tells him, as per my interview that I have with him, it's about their feelings of the Vietnam War. And where Paul gets wrong credit for this is a few years after I interviewed Alan Livingston, Mojo Magazine interviewed Alan Livingston. And in the interview, Alan Livingston says, Paul told me that the purpose of the cover was it was you know, about war. And, of course, Alan, a few years after interviewing me, was a little bit older and a little bit further from it and, quite frankly, a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. And that's how Mojo started the false statement that Paul was the one who pushed for the butcher cover. It was not Paul. It was John. There was a press conference where um, someone, I believe, asked them, about it and, and they said it's what's what's the meaning of this cover and and john said it's as relevant as vietnam isn't that wasn't that yes I mean, he said yeah. it's relevant as vietnam if americans can take the war they can take this cover mm-hmm. and of course mm-hmm. americans in 1966 could accept the uh, vietnam war but not the cover yes, one of the other interesting true. things is yeah. ralph j gleason writing for the san francisco i think it's chronicle later rolling stone um said that he was not disturbed by it at all, felt it was, you know, pop art satire and black humor mm-hmm. and said, isn't it strange that we have this horrified and shrill reaction to the cover when real babies in Vietnam are having their heads blown off and being seared by napalm? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Ralph Gleason and John were on the same wavelength on that. So, so interesting Bruce, stuff. How so, many of these got out into the stores? Well, into the stores, hardly any, because here's what happened. Capital had, you know, close to at least a half a million, if not a million, you know, at that point in time, but at least a half a million with their 25 distributors nationally. And while it's his music store, which (laughs) here's a little fun thought. The guy was one of the co-founders of Capital. So lo and behold, that store would get Beatles product a day or two ahead of everyone else. Well, they got the butcher cover, and apparently some copies were sold there. Mm -hmm. Capital was able to pull the album back from their distribution centers. But what they weren't able to do quick enough was some job rackers who would put it Mm. in drugstores, in places like that. Mm -hmm. And so you could have bought the album at, say, a, you know, a 5 and 10 drugstore somewhere, right. possibly even a Sears Roebuck somewhere. And I think yeah. some were sold by Sears. Uh-huh. So yeah. some got out, and then when the recall hit, those people pulled them immediately. But it was possible to buy the butcher cover if you were in the right place at the right time. I know someone who did. And um, about two weeks later, she brought it back because she wanted the same cover as all her friends had. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad. Gonna, yeah, that, that's a great I gonna, story. I was going to ask how many people actually returned it to Capitol. Uh, Capitol I asked Alan Livingston. 
I asked Alan Livingston that, and he said very few, if any. Now, of course, we still need to talk about the trunk cover. And basically, George Osaki was told, you need to come up with a, you know, a replacement cover. Well, George didn't want to use the one that Brian rejected, and he didn't want to use the boring one with the block letters. So what he did was he took alternate design two, which was a trunk with a white background, and he shifted the positioning of the trunk slightly to the left, and in doing so, left the upper right corner available to use what they already had, the black overlay of the album title and the song titles in mm -hmm. that psychedelic font. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how it was done. The digital book shows you essentially how he did it. And Osaki, when I interviewed him, confirmed that's what he did. So what you have to remember is the order is trunk, butcher, trunk. And I know that, you know, is surprising to many people. Yeah. Now, so, the digital book has all of the essential photos from the butcher session, not just shots of the, you know, the raw meat in that, but the, uh, you know, the photos of, uh, you know, the bird cage and the nails and the beetles on the floor with the baby doll parts. And also explains the inf inspiration from that was Hans Belmer's book, Die Puppy, which in German translates to the doll. And the book has a picture of the cover of that book, The Doll, which shows, you know, a part of a, a doll that's been cut up. So, you know, you get a lot of images and things that you probably haven't seen before, but certainly not in one place. And then it also has, you know, all the different trunk designs and sessions, you know, pictures from the trunk session that were taken with Thomas Beale's camera, including some shots, you know, that Thomas Beale is in that obviously were taken by someone, you know, when he just handed his camera to them and said, hey, take my picture. They weren't mm -hmm. doing selfies in those days. <laughs> yeah. So how many copies actually went out of the butcher cover before it was returned? Well, we know that they sent out, you know, thousands of promotional copies that went out. And we know capital employees, even though they would be fired if it was discovered that they did so, you know, grabbed a bunch of copies. So the number of first day butchers out there, it's hard to say, but it's got to be in the thousands. And then the number of covers that Capital was destroying the butcher covers and just somebody got the bright idea of, look, there's nothing wrong with the cardboard and there's nothing wrong with the back of the album cover. What if we paste over the uh, slick for the butcher mm. cover, mm. you know, by using the trunk cover and paste over that? And there are hundreds of thousands of those out there, tons of them out there. Um, you know, not as many as ones without it. But there are literally hundreds of thousands of paste, paste overs out there, are potential butcher peels, as we say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just one thing that I you know, just found out recently, and that was that a sealed butcher cover stereo, and not, an, not even a Livingston butcher, went at auction for 125000 Wow. <laughs> and I just found that out today, which really blew me away, because, uh, you know, that is significant the highest livingston butcher stereo sale was at about eighty thousand. this tops it at 125 which means uh, theoretically a livingston butcher would go for even more mm -hmm. stereo livingston butcher that is yeah there are only four of those known in existence and nobody's selling them these days right right mm -hmm. well. can i ask, change the subject and ask a question about the uh, hollywood bowl album yes what I mean, they basically went back and forth on this. I mean, they did. They were going. Capital was going to do it. They recorded it. Then they didn't put it out because George apparently George Martin apparently didn't like it. Then they put it out in the seventies, and and then there's been the delay. I mean, it's at the practically at the top of everybody's wish list for a CD <laughs> version, and there has been none. Yeah. So why why the back and forth on this the way it's the way it's gone, Bruce? I mean, I think it will eventually happen, but you have to understand the way that Apple has done things. They take a very systematic, one-thing-at-a-time approach. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what they put out, what they put out has been of the highest quality. The only real legitimate criticism that people can make, and of course you can make a lot of criticisms, but the real legitimate one is, gee, we'd like to see more things come out sooner than they do. Mm -hmm. So... There are other things that have taken priority. For example, this year is the year of the Ron Howard movie. You know, that's a big deal. Right. So 
I wouldn't expect if Apple is true to form, I wouldn't expect other things rushed out this year. You know, and in the past, if you look at things, and I'm not basing this on inside information, I'm basing this on the pattern that you see from Apple. Last year was the one videos. And yeah. people might say, gee, it was 10 years too late. But look, it was great. You know, they everything was cleaned well, but, up beautifully. But, but so, Bruce, yeah. w w in your in your um, experience discussing things with Apple, what, how do they conceive of human life expectancy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one I, thing a year is very nice, but you know, there's a lot of I, things. I, I, no, I, look, I understand that, and you know, in, in in my talks, I have suggested more ambitious schedules. And it's possible that at some point in time, there may be an acceleration of it. And I think that the things that you keep in mind, yes, the life expectancy of your fan base, and also the fact that physical format is something that is, you know, moving to be a niche market now. Right. And that there always <clears throat> will be a market for physical format, but it will continue to shrink. Not only do people like first generation fans do we die but as we get older we downsize yeah so if you're moving from a big house with the wife and kids for all these years and the kids are gone and you and the wife are wondering why we're in a four bedroom house anymore and you downsize to a small condo or relatively small then you have less space for stuff and physical product takes up space so that's another factor and I think these things are being, you know, are being made aware. I think the people at Apple are aware of them. And I do think that not based on inside information, but just based on general observation, I think we will see in the next coming years, and I don't mean the next two decades, but in the next, uh, you know, coming years, some of the things that Beatle fans have been looking for. Jonathan Clyde of Apple is as much said so that we know what the fans want and we want to get it out. So I think that these things will happen. Um, but as, as I've said, based on the way things go, I would not expect anything this year other than the uh, Ron Howard film. Well, I would never downsize my Beatle collection anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And, uh, you know, and believe me, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I do expect that there will be things that will make Beatle fans very happy in the coming years. And, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm not talking a 20-year time frame, but I'm not talking about a two-year time frame either. So somewhere in between that time frame. So what about? Uh, uh, but you were going to. I was going to. Uh, I asked you about the Hollywood Bowl specifically. Yeah. Is there? I mean, is that what was the back and forth on that? Because, I mean, they were going to do it, and and then they apparently didn't like it, and then they, then they put well, what it out. What happened back 70s. in the 60s was that George Martin felt that. The studio recordings were better, so why should we put it out? Capital, from having released live albums of the Kingston Trio that were big sellers, <laughs> and getting ready to release a live Beach Boys album, knew that the album would sell in the millions, and was extremely frustrated when they were not allowed to put it out. And they, you know, they recorded in '65, and once again, you know, the Beatles management said no. And finally, in the '70s, you know, they were allowed to do something george martin got involved and did kind of a, a best of the hollywood bowl album where he took things from both the 64 and 65 concerts and put them out you know i like many other people have heard the 64 have heard the 64 concert in its entirety and yeah there are three songs where maybe they miss a note or two on the vocals but the excitement of the concert outweighs to me whatever shortcomings there were and yeah i'd love to see it come out mm-hmm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I'm sure I'm not alone in that, and I'm sure Apple is aware of that. I have a question about the butcher cover, just going back to that. You were talking about uh, Brian Epstein approving the, the cover, I guess mainly to please John. Um, but didn't Paul have any say? Because I just can't picture Paul approving that, even though he was a part of it, being no, the Paul, most image think, conscious of the Beatles, you know? I think Paul got into it because, you know, John was talking about it, and in just, you know, in a temporary lapse of judgment of the Beatles image, I think Paul was like, oh, yeah, that's fab. That's, you know, fine. And George and Ringo went along because they knew, quite frankly, their votes wouldn't have mattered in this case, that John and Paul were excited about it. 
Hmm. And if you look at the anthology quotes, George says, you know, this is a stupid thing, you know. And then, you know, Ringo says, well, one of these things happens while life passes you by type thing. Paul, you know, why did the Beatles pose in Butcher Smocks to begin with? Um, George and Ringo certainly weren't terribly enthused about it. John was, uh, you know, Salvador Dali, you know, type things, surreal type things. Mm -hmm. Paul went along for it, if you read his anthology quote, because we tended to do what photographers told us to do. Dezo Hoffman told us to wear eyeglasses because pictures with us wearing eyeglasses would help sell, you know, Beatle albums to uh, Beatle pictures that would be put in eyeglass magazines, which would help sell Beatle albums. So Paul went along for it because he was the dutiful Beatle who wanted to please the photographer. You know, and that's kind of the things you can kind of pull from the quotes from anthology. George looks um, pretty but, happy in it. I mean, if you look at the butcher cover, he's standing behind the the other three of them. He's got a big mm, smile. Yeah, uh, you know. That's yeah, true. but he he says he was, you know, and, and I believe George probably, you know, it's it's. Uh, I don't know if I'd quite call it a smile. It's more of a smirk than a smile. I think. <laughs> okay. Hmm. But I, I take George at his word that. He really wasn't all into it. Certainly in hindsight, he was very much against it. Hmm. As he says, quite rightly, someone said, do we really need this on an album cover? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of other album covers, one of the other things that is in the digital book, because I know some of your listeners are saying, look, I have a print book. Why do I need something digital? I, you know, I don't even own a yeah. digital book. Right. Well, there are, you know, not only the butcher stuff, but... Um, the original artwork for the Beatles story album is in there, which shows that they actually tore up photographs and pasted them on the board. Um, the original artwork for Beatles 65, the Bob Whitaker Four Seasons montage. But what's interesting is there's an alternate cover design where the top primary photo was going to be shown in black silhouette only. And then Capitol thought better of it. And then for Beatles 6, we finally get the complete photo that was used on that cover. The cover's cropped, and in the book you see the complete photo. And not only that, but you find out that that photo was part of an elaborate photo session <laughs> for Fabulous Magazine that involved two <clears throat> photographers and that these images were used on four consecutive issues during the holiday season. It's funny because when, when you see the whole photo, it looks like they're cutting a birthday cake or something. It's and not I, a birthday it, cake. What is it? It's a, it's a Christmas cake. Oh, all right. And Same the thing. reason you know it's a Christmas cake <laughs> is because those red things you see around the cake are crackers. Crackers. You know, right? you pull the things and they pop. Right. And also, if you look at some of the other pictures of the cake, including something where John has a piece and stuff on his head. It says Merry Christmas. It's a cake decoration mm, right. that says Merry Christmas. So but without so the cake, you, said you, it's, you well, can't People quite... that have said it's John's birthday cake are totally <laughs> wrong. It's not John's birthday cake. It's a Christmas cake. Yeah. Without, <clears throat> without the cake, which is you know the cover of the album, you don't get the cake at all. I always sort of wondered, you know, what are they holding there? I mean, it's, Yeah, you know, it's it looks like an umbrella or, an ice, or, or a, golf or club. a mic, you know, microphone cord. <laughs> But you see, readers yeah. who buy the digital book now can have their cake and eat it, too. <laughs> really? Oh. really? Uh. <laughs> yes, which uh. they're doing on the next page, 162. Bruce, <laughs> Bruce let, me ask, let me ask something else. Um, in the book, you say that, uh, I mean, there's always been the, the uh, criticism about the Capitol albums being, you know, how Capitol uh, rejiggered them uh, from the British albums. But you said that Meet the Beatles was perfect for America. Why? Yeah. yeah, I mean, first of all, look, you know, the Beatles had 14 songs on their albums. In America, we did 11 or 12 for financial mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. And the short story is royalties are computed differently. In America, it's per song, and in the U.K., per disc, where you divide it, and each publisher gets a pro rata share. So in this case, they weren't going to have a 14-song album for with the Beatles. And here's the thing about Capitol. Kids traditionally did not buy albums. A big selling album was 250,000 units. Mm -hmm. And Capitol's philosophy was hit singles make hit albums. And so they had to put I Saw Her Standing There and I Want to Hold Your Hand on that album. That had to be on the album. Sure, People sure. who miss the point say I Saw Her Standing There was randomly pulled from the first album. No, that's not true. The hit mm -hmm. single, and they knew it was going to be a hit single, 
I Want to Hold Your Hand, I Saw Her Standing There to open the album because hit singles make hit albums. They were familiar with this boy because they were sent the single, I Want to Hold Your Hand. They chose not to use it as the B-side because they wanted to play it safe and have rockers on both sides. But they Mm -hmm. knew this boy was a brilliant song. So that was the third track. Then they took, in the running order of With the Beatles, every song from With the Beatles that was written by a Beatle, either John and Paul or George's Don't Bother Me, that got them up to 11. And then to throw in a song that mom and dad could even love, Till There Was You, a ballad Uh music man. And that was how the album was put together. It's brilliant. Now, Beatles' second album is a pieces, parts album. You had your Uh. five leftover rockers from the first album. You had, uh, you know, She Loves You and I'll Get You. You had Thank You, Girl. And Capitol had two songs that had yet to come out in the UK, uh, you know, with, um, you know, Long Tall Sally and I Call Your Name. Now, although this is a pieces, parts album, even people that hate what Capitol did to the catalog will tell you begrudgingly and sometimes even admittedly and glowingly, the Beatles' second album is a brilliant rock and roll album. So Mm. Capitol's two for two. Not bad for a company that supposedly butchered the Beatles. Something new, yeah, you know, (laughs) when you compare it to the soundtrack album or what could have been, yeah. Yeah. And then when you get to Beatles 65 and Beatles 6, which I call, you know, Beatles for Sale Part 1 and Part 2, okay. (laughs) But then if you look at what they did with Rubber Soul, Rubber Soul in the U.K. is a masterpiece. Rubber Soul in the U.S. is a different listening experience and also a masterpiece that mm-hmm. has a folk rock sound. Mm-hmm. Yep. If you really want to get on the Capitol bandwagon, let's go to Magical Mystery Tour. In England, it is a double EP. Capitol puts it on one side of an album in a running order that probably makes more sense than the EPs. And mm-hmm. on the other side, puts on five songs from singles. And it is just a much better listening experience. You're not getting up and flipping records over all the time. I think if you count the singles, you would have had to flip the records about a half a dozen times, maybe sure. more, to have that just right. flipped once. So much so that nine years later, EMI realized it was better and put it out. And it also is in the core Apple catalog. Mm-hmm. So here's the thing. Capital did not butcher the Beatles. Capital marketed the Beatles. What they did was no different than what any other record company in the U.S. did. And it was no different than what other record companies did with the Beatles albums in other countries. So I think Capital's taken a bad rap over the years. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we should ignore the Beatles catalog. I mean, after all, you know, in the U.K., it's what they wanted. And Mm -hmm. certainly that is the official catalog. But to ignore what Capital did and to just you know, toe the party line of Capital Butchered the Beatles is really not being accurate or honest. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. You make a a good point there, Bruce, and and, um, I certainly would agree with everything you just said. My only question is that apart from what you were saying about Meet the Beatles and especially uh, Magical Mystery Tour as well, was there really much thought in the sequencing of the songs on a lot of those albums like Beatles 65, Beatles 6? Because... If you look at the, the British counterparts, the, um, the sequencing in many cases is almost the same. Yes. You've always I got a group of songs connected, you know, whether it's five, six, seven in a row. You know, that's, uh, do they really think about what songs belong on each album? I think what they were doing was, look, we're going to be doing some things differently because we're adding singles. But the running order really works. George Martin did a good job on that, so... Why should we randomly change the running order? And that's a very good point you make, is that, you know, Capital did not go in and throw everything around. If Meet the Beatles is the exact same running order, except it Mm. opens up with three songs that weren't on the album and drops five rock and roll cover songs. Now, bear in mind, Capital's decision to drop those songs, they were probably thinking at the time, we want to showcase the songwriting talents of the members of the group, which makes perfect sense. And furthermore... Why would an American want to hear the Beatles do Roll Over Beethoven when they've got the Chuck Berry, you know, single somewhere? Mm-hmm. And, of course, when Roll Over Beethoven as a Canadian single was imported into the U.S. in large numbers, Capital realized 
Americans want to hear the Beatles doing Roll Over Beethoven and these other songs. And on the cover to the Beatles' second album, it even says featuring Roll Over Beethoven and She Loves You. They wanted to release Roll Over Beethoven as the follow-up single to I Want to Hold Your Hand until George Martin said, guys, would you just wait a week or two? We've got something <laughs> new called Can't Buy Me Love. And I believe Can't Buy Me Love came out in the States about a week or two ahead of the UK release. Mm -hmm. So, you know, George yeah. Martin wanted that to be the follow-up single, and they allowed Capitol to put it out sooner, uh, you know, so Capitol would quickly have a follow-up single. They wanted a follow-up single because VJ had put out Please Please Me and was following, and had already followed that up with Twist and Shout and Do You Want to Know a Secret? So by that time, Capitol desperately wanted to put out a new single. Now we we've yeah. touched a bit on the uh, the digital books, or at least the the third digital book, the yes. uh, the, the the Capital Albums book. But uh, and of course, this is tough to do in audio only. But maybe you can give us just a kind of a brief schematic of because it's there are now three books of yours your th first three books now are all available in digital form and maybe yeah. you can give us a brief description right well the the idea behind it was that these books had sold out and were going for big bucks in the secondary market the vj book you know three four five hundred dollars capital right. books well over a hundred in some of my younger fans of you know of beetle books it asked me why don't you put it out on digital i couldn't economically do it as a print edition book because the technology had changed the plates had been destroyed in hurricane katrina mm -hmm. you know and it, it just would have cost a fortune and so when i got the idea to do it i thought look i don't want to make people rebuy the same thing twice i want to give them good value for their money so if i'm going to do this as a digital book it's going to be revised and expanded and so as I started doing the VJ thing, I realized there were all sorts of new things I'd learned. I had gotten, you know, the guy who had done the four faces that you see on several VJ picture sleeves and album covers. I, you know, now I knew who he was and I knew how much he was paid for that design and all sorts of other things. And then I began to realize one of the cool things about digital was, you know, you could have internal links to where, you know, when you made a reference to something, someone could tap that reference and it'd take them to that page. And then we added a sidebar where we had something called the get back key, where you could tap the get back key and it would take you back to where you once were reading, if not where you once belonged. And so, you know, that worked out well. And you could expand the size of images. So you could take a look at the image of the From Me to You single by Del Shannon and expand it to where you could clearly see the songwriting credit was McCartney Lennon and things like that. And, you know, when tons of new information and the other great thing about digital was, look, when you do a print edition book, once it's in print, it's there. And if there are errors in it, those errors don't go away. Mm. But digital book, you know, we had like version 1.1. So some people spot some errors they email me. I send them a no prize and we do version 1.1 and we correct some of those. And we let people who bought the book know, you know, the download. Hey, there's a new version out you can download. We did a major re-expansion of the VJ book because about a year after the VJ book came out, I was able to get the VJ singles and the album introducing the Beatles certified gold and platinum by the RIAA. Right. So we added that information to the book. So if you bought the digital book when it first came out, you were sent a notice of, hey, there's a new download with new information. So that flexibility is really great. Now, the Capital Album books, you know, when you're doing a print edition, you've got a real page count issue. You know, each page costs money, and you can't add, mm. add a page or two. Things are done by signatures. So sometimes if you add a couple of pages, you're adding 16 pages. So, you know, it becomes a real issue. With a digital book, page count is pretty much irrelevant. So I was able to add more information on um, you know, the history of Capitol Records, more information on the history of the 45 RPM single, which right. is part one of the Capitol book. And mm -hmm. I mean, I added several pages on every non Beatles or every British single that Capitol released pre Beatles. And, you know, had stories, images of most of the records, stories behind the records, and a chart that gave the sales figures for these records. 
Yeah. Um, I was also able to add information about the jukebox singles that Capitol put out that played at 33 and a third and mm. explain how that happened, the history of the jukeboxes, all kind of cool stuff that isn't purely Beatles. But if you're a first generation fan, you remember that stuff. For me, it was vindication. I yeah. remember going into bar, well, you know, in New Orleans, you could go into bars as a kid, but bars or hamburger joints or restaurants where there were jukeboxes that had five album covers running along the top, you know, seven inch by seven inch album covers. And for a quarter, you could play a side of that and hear three songs from the album. And it was nice when I did my research to see, yeah, the Seaberg you know, Corporation put out that type of jukebox. And I found that ad in Billboard that showed me that TAC Amusement Company in New Orleans bought tons of those. So, you know, my memories were validated, which is always kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the album book, we added a section on the history of the vinyl album. You know, how that came about, explain where the term album came from. That came from the fact that you had 78s that had two songs, one on each side, not much mm -hmm. playing time. And for classical works, what they would do would be to have it recorded over, se you know, several different 78s. You know, it might be as many as four to eight different 78s. And the discs themselves were put in these pages and it was put together in what looked like a photo album, and they were called mm -hmm. albums. So when huh. Columbia invented the long play microgroove record, they were called albums because they didn't just have two songs on them. They had, you know, 8 to 10 to 12 to 14 songs. As many as 16 on a Frank Sinatra album. Yeah. Mm. So, wow. you know, a lot of interesting information that, you know, you always wondered about, and now you know. Why, why they're called albums. And, you know, and also the fact that Capital was one of the first companies to license the 45 RPM technology from RCA and also one of the first companies to license the uh, long playing microgroove technology from Columbia and was actually the first label to issue things in all three formats, 78, 45, and LP. So... Capital was a very innovative company, and, you know, it gets me really mad when people say Capital didn't know what they were doing, Capital, mm. Butcher, Beatles, and all of this other stuff. It's simply not true. When I was in graduate business school, I concentrated in finance and marketing. So, you know, it was fun to see this, and you go over history. Capital was the first record company to do something really unique, to market their product directly to the consumer. Prior to the Beatles campaign, for the most part, record companies took out ads in cash box and billboard and engaged in payola. Their mm -hmm. thinking was, if DJs get the records and play them, and if distributors have the records to send to record stores, we've done our job. You know, we think second nature now. Of course you're going to market to the consumer. No one had done that prior to Capital with the Beatles campaign. Huh. Bruce, how would you... How would you? Um, I, I'm and you were you kind of referred to this earlier, but I'm going to ask it again. There's always the criticism about the fact that you know that uh, we've been waiting so long for things, and and um, from the point of view, of the fact that you've had some dealings with them, how aware are they of what's going on on the internet? How aware are they of what's being said about them? And you you mentioned that they're aware of what fans want but i mean really how aware are they how are especially when we're when we talk about you know the brain trust themselves how aware are they well i think when i say apple i think apple in the sense of the apple office in london is aware of these things mm -hmm. and you know the apple office in london is one thing and then there is john's widow yoko and george's widow olivia and there's Paul and there's Ringo. And so anything that Apple does is going to need approval of the surviving Beatles and Yoko and Olivia. And so that adds an extra step in the decision-making process that you may not have where a record company has complete autonomy. So you have a multi-layered thing here. If you look at it, and once again, this is an inside information. These are observations that anyone can see. You have Universal Music Group, which owns the Masters. And Universal, when it was Capital and EMI, and I'm speculating on this because uh, the, the 
litigation itself, these cases were sealed. They were settlements, and the settlements have never been made public. But I think it's safe to assume that as part of the settlement, Apple was given complete artistic control over the issuance of the masters that are still owned by EMI and Capital are now being owned by Universal Music Group. Hmm. So you um, now the, have... The, the Beatles lawyer, Leonard Marks, in, in New York, actually confirmed that for me. So it, it's not... You don't even have to say it's surmise. It's, it's, that's what okay. it is. Yeah. I do appreciate that, Alan. I Anytime. appreciate you bailing me out on that. <laughs> so now, now, now we know, because I don't want to be responsible for leaking anything. I'm not leaking anything. No. So what I'm saying is you now have a situation where you've got three different decision makers, whereas normally a record company is one decision maker. So I do think that that is one of the reasons that things do not come as quickly as a case where if you had an autonomous record company that could just say, okay, we're going to reissue the Kinks catalog and this is what we're going to do. You know, and yeah, we'll see if Ray Davies approves of it, if he wants to be involved and we own the masters and if he doesn't like it tough, we're going to do it. Universal cannot do that. And so now you're dealing with Universal, Apple, and the Apple board, as it were. So that's three layers. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe people now will have a better understanding and sympathy or appreciation for the situation. So that may not be a happy answer, but that's reality. Right. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce, do you have any uh, plans for further books, either in physical or digital form, uh, besides refurbishing the back catalog? Do you have, do you have new projects that you're working on? Uh, not at this time. Um, you know, I've been pretty busy with the law practice. I do some consulting work for Universal and Apple. And, uh, you know, right now that consulting work is not a lot of time. In the future, it might be more. I don't know whether it will be or not. In the event, it would be more. That would leave less time for me, obviously, to do book products because at this stage of my life, I don't think I'm going to be practicing from law anytime terribly soon. My grandfather retired from the practice of law at 91. Mm -hmm. I don't know <laughs> if I'll be practicing law 30 more years or not. But um, anyway, uh, I'm certainly not going to be retiring from the practice of law within the next year or two. So I don't foresee any new book projects. And quite frankly, I've, you know, I've covered the American records. I've covered how Beatlemania evolved in America and I've covered the British records so I don't know what else you know people make suggestions to me one suggestion is uh, a fan club book or one on merchandising uh, one suggestion was do one on all the Beatles lawsuits to which I replied oh yes let me do a book that will get Apple Universal Capital EMI Paul Ringo uh, Yoko Olivia and probably a bunch of other people mad at me so that book will never happen. <laughs> Actually, somebody's already somebody's done one of those, or at least a yeah, couple the, of them. I, there are a few of them out there now, and I'm just glad that my name's not in any of them. And <laughs> if any of the powers that Beetle are listening, those are not pen names that I used. I have not written such a book, and I never <laughs> will write such a book. Okay. And when I'm dead, there won't be a manuscript. Do they seem <laughs> accurate to you? Have you read them? Parts of them are accurate. <laughs> and there's some that are bitterly disappointing. There was a book that some guy who used to work at Capitol or was a lawyer for Capitol that he put it out and he wrote it off the top of his head and it shows. Mm. I won't give its title, but it's um, highly recommended one, not to buy. I think I know the one you're talking about. So, Bruce, this has been great. And uh, looking forward to the digital versions of the rest of the collection. Uh, what, what's next? Well, um, you know, the America. next one would probably be the, the Apple book. And, uh, of course, I have to plug my website, which is just Beatle, B-E-A-T-L-E dot net. And there are also some fun articles and stuff, and I'll be adding more articles on it. So even if you don't go to the website to buy the books, check out the articles. It's free. There's a wonderful one where shortly after April Fool's Day, check out the Paul McCartney Admits Death Hoax article that was originally mm -hmm. published on April Fool's Day many years back. <laughs> and a few other things. There's also one called Remember the Titans, which explains the group, the Titans, who are on that MGM Beatles album, and a lot of fun stuff like that. Okay. So um, if you want to contact us, uh, we can be reached by email at thingswesaidtodayradioshow at gmail.com. 
We do Very read good. your letters. We sometimes respond. Um, I should take this opportunity to say that um, you know we've had a number of letters about our not having done a show about George Martin right after he died, and the th- fact is that we had done a show about George Martin for his 90th birthday. Um, we devoted a full show to him, and our feeling was basically that we had you know we would just end up repeating what we had just said a few weeks earlier, um, what we probably should have done is refer you guys back to that show and give it another listen if you or if you had missed it the first time. But yeah, you know, we, we had, that was our tribute to George Martin and um, please give it a listen if you haven't heard it. It's on Podbean and it's on, uh, uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, I'm looking back to see which one it was. Um, but yeah, it, it was uh, on iTunes number 165. As well. Yeah, it's on iTunes as well. It's number 165. Okay. But, you know, we are uh, happy to field your comments, any suggestions you have uh, for shows you'd like to hear us do. Uh, We're interested in that, too. Um, You can also follow us on Twitter at uh, the at sign things we said fab. And um, we all have various Facebook pages. Steve, do you want to mention yours? I have my own personal Facebook page, and I have a Beatles News group, uh, Beatles News and Commentary, um, that uh, you're welcome to join and uh, and uh, talk about uh, anything you want. Okay. And Ken? Uh, you can always visit my website for weekly Beatles trivia and interviews with lots of people connected to the Beatles, including Bruce, who I've interviewed before, and that's on my website too, kenmichaelsradio.com. Okay, you have any contests coming up? Every single week there's a a regular contest where you can win one of nine prizes, including books, CDs, DVDs, the new DVD for How I Won the War. Actually, I should say Blu-ray for How I Won the War. Uh, We had uh, Jude Kessler on our show a few weeks back. Her first book called Should Have Been There. Her narrative biography on John you could win. All kinds of things. The uh, McCartney remasters, the Beatles won, the CD and DVD. So that's all on the website. Go check it out, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And Al? On Facebook, uh, uh, Al Sussman. On Twitter, at ASUSS49. And rather than do the usual nonsense that people do on Facebook and Twitter, uh, I try to give some information and so I do kind of almanacy type things and sometimes I'm able to find out some interesting little nuggets like the fact that today is the 110th birthday of B Benadaret. Hmm. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> now, who among you knows who B Benadaret? Oh, I know. I do. I do. Okay. Hediko Junction. Right. And, and also Betty, she Betty was from, in the Betty from the Flintstones. And she was on the Burns and Allen show. Exactly. She was. Mm. Um, and you might have... And, I, and I'm the youngest one here. I'm the youngest right. one here, too. Well, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Okay, so um, thanks for listening, and uh, we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.